So joining me now, Dr. John Sheehan, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I have to say, I think this series uh, for World Health Day is a very interesting one. And I'm I've been very excited to speak to you because we've had a, an interesting story. We've been looking at you know the future of healthcare. I spoke to, and we've been taking a bit around the world as well. So I spoke to Dr. X, who spoke about the future of healthcare and telemedicine in Thailand and how she launched the first ever mental well-being app in Thailand. Then we went over to India. I got to speak to Dr. Uh, Abnish about the usage of AI in healthcare and some ethics that he wanted to bring up and regulatory um, discussion, which was really interesting. And now I have you here uh, all the way from Ireland, But what, the way I see you is you're at the front line of a huge amount of change that is happening in Europe, Ireland, UK. And I think it's just a brilliant story that we're hearing from all sides. So thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, uh, Asia. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, uh, delighted to join you. Thank you. So I guess for our listeners, um, Why don't we start with you telling us a little bit about yourself and your connection to the world of technology and healthcare? Sure. Uh, Well, uh, like yourself, I won the uh, Burt Lottery and was born in the the wonderful Isle of Ireland. And um, I had uh, two wonderful parents uh, and I had an uncle in uh, medicine. He was a surgeon and I had the opportunity to work uh, in a hospital from the age of 15 uh, for 10 years. Wow. So that really kind of exposed me to everything. I started off uh, sweeping the grounds, painting, window cleaning, portering, um, and then ultimately I got to see people operate in the clinical um, environment. Uh, So it really kind of opened my eyes up to uh, a world of um, a hospital's ecosystem, really from, you know, a 360 perspective. So I uh, decided I'd like to do medicine. Uh, And I said, my uncle was a uh, surgeon. And he said to me, he said, uh, medicine is really a privilege to practice. And uh, I have to say it really has been a privilege and um, it continues to be, and uh, it never stops uh, amazing me uh, what the human body is, um, how we can diagnose things and ultimately uh, treat things. So um, I did medicine. did surgery for two years and then transitioned into radiology um, where I was trained in Ireland and then ultimately I went over to Chicago uh, to complete a number of fellowships um, in the Northwestern. Came back, um, I was married, uh, I have two wonderful kids and uh, I've been back in Ireland since 2010. So um, yeah, so I, I kind of uh, wear quite a number of hats um throughout the day now at this stage it's it's kind of all evolved nothing's happened suddenly and um so i suppose the the first hat that i wear is i work in a group called black rock health it's a it's a hospital group with about three hospitals um and i'm a radiologist where i do diagnostic and interventional radiology and i'm the clinical director of radiology in one of the hospitals and i have a I suppose uh, uh, always an interest in technology. So I've kind of developed a big interest in um, cloud and artificial intelligence, augmented reality um, throughout that role in the hospital group. And then I've had the real privilege and opportunity to get involved in two uh, healthcare startup companies, um, which are co-related, but different in different ways. So I'm involved as an original BAM member in a company called Mobile Medical Diagnostics where we uh, move equipment and not patients, where we do, um, for example, x-rays in nursing homes. And it has a really positive impact on on people. Um, and I'm the clinical director of that. Then the, the, second com- the second company that I'm involved with as a startup is um, a company co-founded by a friend, um, uh, Professor Ronan Colleen, and it's a company called X-Wave. And it's a cloud-based uh, solution for uh, enabling and empowering physicians to order the best test first by using a clinical decision support tool. Um, uh, so it's a smart radiology referral tool. And then the final hat, um, if that's not enough, is um, I'm 
a member and the clinical vice chair of the Irish Digital Health Leadership Steering Group, uh, which is led by a, a great guy called uh, Professor Martin Curley. Um, so that's kind of um, where I've come from and where I am uh, just right now at the moment. <laughs> Oh my God. Uh, you know, I'd say if we were to separate all of those things, we could end up speaking here for hours, <laughs> which is brilliant. And it's so exciting, like so exciting and so interesting. But um, one thing I want to know is when you talk about wearing multiple hats in life, I'd love to know, is there a common thread that weaves through each of these hats? Yeah, so um, it's a good question. Um, I think it comes down to the reality of what they are, but also what I personally value in life. Yeah. Um, so clearly they're all medical um, and they're fundamentally all about the patient. Uh, and actually, you know, you I think you need to either as a person or as a healthcare company need to have a set of values. And I think the first value should always be patient first. Um, obviously, collaboration and innovation and excellence are part of those. Um, for me, um, I'm, I'm very privileged, as I said, to practice medicine and um, uh, I'm very lucky. I don't um, and I've never put money as a focus of doing anything um, that kind of looks after itself. And I think um, When I was chatting to you um, previously, we talked mm -hmm. about Ikigai, actually, which is only something I've come across in the last um, 18 months. And that's that Japanese reason for being. And it really resonated with me. And it doesn't mean that you have to um, achieve this in life, because otherwise some people could feel very frustrated. Um, mm -hmm. But I feel, again, privileged that I have the opportunity to do these four things that Ikigai talks about, doing something that I'm good at. Um, doing something that I love. I love people, I love technology, I love healthcare. Um, it obviously pays um, the mortgage. Um, and also it actually allows me to help patients, um, whether it's people in the hospital, the group um, in Ireland or indeed uh, across the globe and the various mm -hmm. things that I'm involved with. So um, I guess patient um, is the key focus mm -hmm. for me. And, you know, for those listening, Ikigai is putting your what you love at the center of what you love, isn't it? What you love, what the world needs. And it's a full. Yeah, so it, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's essentially trying to achieve the sweet spot of life. Yeah. So, you know, what you're good at, what you love, what pays and what the world needs. Yes, there it is. And but uh, as I said, you know, it's a great way to be able to aspire to things and it's it's great to get to that point. But, um, you know, I, I think people in life shouldn't feel that if they don't have a key guy that they're a failure. Yes. It's only something to aspire to um, or to consider. Um, yes. Yeah. I, I like that's a really good point. <laughs> I, I remember coming across it. I read the book about it and uh, watched plenty of videos and it was that mindset where, oh, do I, how do I, how do I get into that center? How do I do that? And mm. uh, taking away that pressure, realistically, in this sense, it's putting people at the center and having the ability for, in your case, to help and really love doing that. And, you know, when we talk about um, people and their ever evolving needs and expectations as, you know, customers and patients, um, in a talk you gave recently that you're kind enough to send on to me, uh, you said something that I found really interesting was around how we expect convenience at every point in life, except healthcare. Um, so I'd really like to know or talk to you a little bit more about that and what you meant by that. Yeah, sure. So um, we as a globe have become very used to Uh, digital technology uh, in its many forms. Um, and uh, I think at the core in healthcare, if we look at it this way, we've got many problems. We've got um, um, staff issues. We can't uh, attract people. We can't retain people. Uh, people are leaving. Um, the cost of healthcare are going up. Um, we've got increased waiting times uh, and increased waiting lists. So 
if you look at all the other industries, um, whether it's shopping, um, you know, we've got Amazon uh, eating, we've got Just Eat. Um, if you want to travel, you've got Airbnb. And if, if you're um, if you're single uh, uh, and you want a date, you can get Tinder. So we kind of have a demand for digital convenience now in our daily lives and we just expect it. We don't expect friction and speed bumps. It just has to be easy. And if it doesn't work, you just bypass it. Whereas um, it seems to be the complete exception in healthcare uh, industry, which is probably far more important in our lives than any of the other industries. You know, if you take traveling or um, um, shopping, uh, they're not necessarily um, at the basic hierarchical needs of people. Mm. So I think we've become somewhat conditioned um, to actually accept um, bad interactions with healthcare, um, which aren't like the ones we experience for shopping. And uh, it just has to change, uh, but it can change, but it needs um, uh, leadership um, because, you know, one of the people that I've learned an awful lot about um, innovation from is uh, Professor Martin Curley, Curley, who's a professor of innovation, and he talks right. about um, the need to uh, digitally transform things um, through uh, open innovation. Um, and uh, it's all possible, uh, but we just have to focus on it collectively. Yes. And when we're talking about change as well, uh, one thing that came to me when doing my research and, you know, chatting to you was that normally speaking, the healthcare industry is seen as one that is very slow to change. Um, and when we're talking about moving from laggards to leaders in Europe, um, I want to know what the driving force of that will be and at what rate are we seeing it or will we see it happen? Yeah, so recently, um, Martin Curley and myself co-chaired a um, session uh, over two days um, in the New York-based um, UN General Assembly Health Summit last year. And we had 50 speakers. And actually, one of the speakers, Richard Jones, an amazing guy, uh, founder of many companies, including C2 AI, but he actually said very eloquently that we're sinking so fast in healthcare that incremental changes just won't cut us. And actually, we need just exponential 10x um, changes. And we just can't get that without actually transitioning from paper to digital, for example. And uh, it's just not possible um, for us to actually achieve it. And there are so many tools out there ranging from cloud to artificial intelligence to um, augmented reality and quantum computing, and that all of these tools are out there um, to solve our problems. And one of the things about healthcare, unlike say so many other industries, whether it's the financial industry or IT industry, and if you take, for example, the development of um, the, the microchip, mm -hmm. and all of these industries have been um, very finely architected uh, from beginning to end. And what we've never actually got is actually a properly architected healthcare system that works for everybody. Um, so I, I think that the system needs to be architected um, with collaboration and to use these tools, because if you take 2023 alone, we've literally got a pivot point in artificial intelligence. People kind of knew a bit about it before, but now everybody's talking about it because of the likes of chat, GBT. And that pivot point is just going to be completely exponential and it's going to have a huge impact um, on all of our lives in every possible manner, whether it's personal or professional and all the different industries that are within the different professions. Um, so I, I think we have the opportunity for things to change and to go from laggard to leader. Um, but uh, as I said, um, Richard said, we're sinking so fast, we need to um, change um, more explosively than incrementally. Yeah. And speaking of those tools, then I, a quote that I saw you had was, AI is not a buzzword, but a pathway. And I'm pretty sure on this post, you said that you had the post written by AI <laughs> on LinkedIn. But I'm wondering yeah. if, you, if you could elaborate on that a bit more. Um, yeah, so AI is kind of a, a word everybody hears about. Sometimes they think it's a 
cool, futuristic. Sometimes they think it's, oh, it's going to um, replace me or it's going to take over the world. Um, and artificial intelligence gets slightly merged with, you know, our intelligence and is it competing with us and maybe ultimately with things like artificial general intelligence, which is AGI, or artificial super intelligence, which is beyond us. Um, but th that's that's many decades uh, at, at the very least um, ahead. I, I think we need to kind of reframe what artificial intelligence is to us today. Um, first of all, it's, it's actually should be seen as a, an assistant or a companion, just like a spell checker was in Word, um, and a companion to actually help us um, to do things better, faster, and cheaper. Um, and our approach to it um, can't be just, it's not flipping it on. It has to be a crawl, walk, run approach in every area of life, and particularly in healthcare, because it's such a vitally important thing because of the challenges that are within AI. It's not perfect. Um, it does make mistakes. It does have bias, and it can hallucinate like chat GBT uh, and mm. say things that are wrong very, very confidently. Um, but I think if we safely crawl, walk, run with AI, it will ultimately make us better, faster, cheaper, and actually a lot of us happier. Um, and GPT, ChatGPT has certainly highlighted that to all of us. Um, and um, I think healthcare will ultimately benefit from the likes of that technology, in addition to other industries such as you know finance, marketing, and um, the creative industries. Um, so I think we need to, and my advice to people when I talk about it is that we need to adapt um, to survive, but actually to thrive as well. And it's very important that we talk to our colleagues and indeed our children uh, in yeah. school to actually educate them what is ahead of them. Because um, the example I give is that if you were a bellboy in a um, hotel in New York in the 1950s, you would have been bringing people up and down the elevator. Um, and then suddenly Otis or whoever manufactures elevators made it automatic. So you could just get in and press the button yourself. And they went on strike and said, well, actually, we can't have this technology replacing us. So um, obviously, we don't have bellboys anymore. But we do now have the need for us to, with AI and all the other um, technologies, to actually, we all need to adapt, as said, to survive and to thrive. Uh, and, and we can certainly do that if we do it, you know, safely. Yeah, really interesting. And the the education point is something that our uh, previous guest, uh, Dr. Avnish, was talking about as well, how important it is to have the freely available education to people and also the ethics behind it with the bias and it's, you know, the data that you put in is what you get out so if you have bias as well it's a kind of a circle around that point point. Uh, when you're talking about other industries um i saw you speak about how something around com the importance of combining clinical technological and business worlds together um and i really liked that and i'd like to go further into that because on a podcast called Commerce Talk, I can only presume that our listeners would be very interested in that angle as well. So, Yeah, so um, it, it, it's it's clearly um, the ecosystem is a very important word that we hear about all the time. And ecosystem actually comes from a biology and it's all about um, flow. And it's about flow from one thing to another. So if we've got um, healthcare, um, there are different parts of it, and often they've become historically siloed. So you have the clinical, you have the technology, and you have the business. But the ecosystem needs to flow and be connected. So my kind of opportunity in life and education and experience and where I am today has given me exposure to being a clinician, um, a technologist, and somebody who's involved in business. So it's given me a 3D, 360 degree appreciation, understanding of what is very complex. And I am no master of it by any manner or means, but it just gives me a, um, I think a, a nice perspective of balance that if you are just in one of the silos, you're, you're not gonna get the other person and what they're thinking about and how they approach it. Because any, um, 
interaction in life or negotiation requires actually understanding what the other person is thinking. So if you are actually that person, um, uh, and I'm not saying I, I've got a schizophrenic mind and I hop from one person to the other, but yeah. um, I think you get the the ideas that yeah. um, understanding those those different ecosystems um, is beneficial um, in healthcare, particularly because it's so complex. But indeed, any industry. Mm. And yeah, it's it's that interesting point. I remember seeing a, a study done around the impact of speaking to strangers and how we believe or we're conditioned to believe that it's going to have a bad outcome but in the studies they saw that there was this opening up of people's minds after they had an encounter with a new person and that opening up was allowing them to continuously learn outside of themselves and I think that is similar in so much of what we speak about today the opening yourself up to view different viewpoints and understand different worlds as you'd put it um and allow yourself to combine resources and knowledge together uh based on everything that we've spoken about today in a snapshot which i know is going to be very hard to do um <laughs> what does the future of healthcare look like to you um I, I think the future has to fundamentally change um, and it's it's really, I think we're at a moment in time where we have these what are called Copernican shifts and it's where we go from being an illness system to a wellness system from a doctor's no best to a patient no best and that's the democratization of, of knowledge from a hospital based system purely to a, a community based system physical to virtual and from treatment um, to prevention. So I, I think the, the kind of the, the focus on healthcare, there needs to be an, an emphasis now of us all working together globally um, to empower people and um, try and eliminate um, disparities and leverage all of these digital tools that we've just talked about um, and the data. Um, and ultimately that will lead to um, much better evidence-based healthcare, and the final thing is that it actually leads to longer, healthier, happier lives for all of us. Um, that's kind of a, a very simple uh, kind of overview of where we are going or need to go. Um, mm. But it's kind of um, the fundamentals, I think, are, are within those um, things I've just mentioned. Yeah. Um, one thing that I always like asking people uh because i just really enjoy seeing the different viewpoints that people have you you know across all of the multiple hats that you wear uh in your position as a leader um in the industry what has been the best advice that you have ever received <laughs> um yeah so um i think best advice is often a hard question to answer because i think ultimately there's so many people who've advised are, I, I think advice comes from either people you know, um, podcasts like this, reading a book or an audio book. Um, as I initially said, my uncle said, um, medicine is a privilege. Um, I know Einstein, and I refer to this regularly in my own mind, is that avoid negative people because they have a, always have a problem uh, for every solution. I think something that really inspired me was something that Warren Buffalo said, and he said many, many things. Um, but this is so important. I just find that within the the area that I'm in, in health tech, um, is being surrounded by positive people. And what Warren Buffett says is surround yourself with people who push you to do and to do better. Um, and just no drama, no negativity, just higher goals um, and higher motivation. And also good times and positive energy. Um, no jealousy, no hate, and just simply bring out the best in each other so so that for me is 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 very inspiring and the other person that i've i always reference is is sam harris who's an amazing neuroscientist um philosopher and he talks about really two very simple things he says the two most important things in life um is love and curiosity um for yourself and uh, for the people around you and uh, for life um and the world and i think 
the other person who I've got to know over the last 12 months really well is a guy called Kingsley Aikens. Um, he's an absolute gent of a guy. Um, you should c connect up with him. Um, he's yeah. the CEO of the Irish Networking Company, or uh, Institute, and former um, CEO and um, uh, president of the Irish American Fund, which you may, may have known with Tony yeah. O'Reilly. But he said people who've got strong and diverse networks, um, they live longer, they are stronger mentally and physically, um, and they earn, earn more money and they're also happier. Um, and he kind of finishes by saying it's no longer about what you know, who you know, but who knows you. So I, I think networking in life um, should be very important because we all rely on other people and it's not about taking it's actually about giving and then it all just works out after itself so so for me i've had an awful lot of different people um um influence me in very positive ways so i i can't give you one specific um no answer. and that's that's plenty to go by and i'm sure <laughs> there's people listening now taking plenty of notes <laughs> uh, i really like that it's the the last part as well is you know this centered around collaboration which is really important in what we're speaking about today too so um i feel like and, uh, and actually just to just yeah. to like to mention about collaboration and, and particularly digital technology because often digital technology uh fails and actually 80 percent of the success of digital technology is leadership and what that requires is what martin curley actually refers to as open innovation 2.0 where you've got high trust networks um sorry, relationships, um, intense networking, shared values and vision, plus the digital technology. So it's not just the digital technology. And when you combine all of that, you get a uh, an outcome that is successful and beneficial to all of the stakeholders. Um, so for me, um, it's so much about the people um, mm. and your relationships and your network um, and like that warren buffett's surrounding yourself with positive people and um, there's so much you can achieve and um, if you do that i'm gonna take that advice <laughs> it's wonderful it's brilliant uh thank you so much and the one of the last things the second last thing was that <laughs> and I, I i said it to you before is that i have a feeling that you have an epic book collection and uh, I'd like to know for the people in the technology and business world, would there be a book or a couple of books that you'd like to recommend for our listeners? Um, so it's interesting. I've actually transitioned to um, audiobooks and it's accelerated my um, reading or listening to books. Um, I just find it so easy uh, to be in the car. So um I've, I've, I, I kind of got out of the habit up until about five years ago of actually reading much books. I didn't have the time. And then suddenly my the car I got was able to take Bluetooth from my phone and I was tapping into audiobooks and podcasts like yours. Mm -hmm. um, so there's an awful lot of basic books. Like I think the first book I read when I was um, had to become clinical director of radiology was um, The One Minute Manager. Um, and it's basically how to manage people, uh, having one minute goals, one minute praise, and uh, one minute directs. And that's by a guy called Kenneth Blanchard. Um, there's another interesting book, and I won't pronounce the last part of it, but it's a guy called Mark Manson who wrote The Subtle Art of Not Giving a You Know What. Yes. Uh, and I think it's really important in life because um, don't take things personally. People are, you know, coming from different um, directions and have good days, bad days, or just. Uh, Wired differently. Um, another good book, um, because I actually developed about six years ago, um, Bad Migraines, and it, it really impacted my life. And I read a great book by Andy Podicum, um, which is entitled Headspace Guide to Mindfulness and Meditation. So it kind of really got me into that um, space of actually um, stopping, thinking, reflecting, and enjoying the moment. Um, despite being sometimes very, very busy. And that, that's really had a positive impact um, on my life. Another important key concept was actually from a book called The Compound Effect, and it's a bit like compound interest, small little incremental changes throughout your day over time, either months or years, can have actually a huge, massive benefit, whether it's your eating or saving money or 
reading books or listening to podcasts yeah. it just all adds up and you don't notice it at the time but actually if you look back a year from now um or you ask me you know what books have i read in the last five years you go wow that's actually really interesting and um, from a medical perspective um probably eric topol's book um deep medicine um, and he kind of clearly talks about the problems we face in healthcare um, because we've become so overwhelmed and busy um, and not actually having enough time to interact with the patients that we need to talk to and um, have relationships with. And he just talks about the role of AI, for example, being able to actually humanize medicine again for healthcare workers and doctors to have more time with the patients by removing the cognitive burden and repetitive tasks and actually giving us an opportunity to actually do healthcare better and have spend more time with our, our patients. And I suppose from a tech perspective, um, the recent book by uh, Tom Lowry, which I think probably a lot of your listeners may be well aware of, which is is called Hacking Healthcare. Uh, and that's really where he kind of explores the intersection of um, healthcare and technology and mm -hmm. ultimately how it can have the potential to improve outcomes, increase access and uh, reduce costs through all the different things that we've talked about, telemeds and mobile health, wearables um, and AI. There's lots of benefits, there's lots of challenges. And as your previous speaker mentioned, there's lots of ethical and regulatory things um, to be aware of. Um, and I suppose the final book um, is written by coming back to our roots for both yourself and myself is uh, After the Roof Caved In. And I highly recommend this. It's a really great autobiography by a, a, a healthcare, by a, but well, he is a healthcare worker, but he's the CEO and president of Northwell Health in, in New York. And it's a guy called Michael Dowling. And he has a very, has had a very positive impact on me as a healthcare professional. I actually got the opportunity to say that to him in person um, oh, last wow. year. So he comes from a, a really um, small little village in Limerick called Nakaderi, and he grew up uh, in very simple, um, impoverished um, surroundings. He had an amazing mother uh, who had hearing difficulties and really got him to read lots of books as she did. And ultimately, to fast forward, he's become the president and CEO of Northwell Health. It's the largest employer in New York State. It's the largest healthcare provider, employs 95,000 people, turnover 15 billion. And the book just goes through how he has come through all of those stages to be where he is and how he's done it. Um, and ultimately, he's a healthcare optimist. Um, and I think you need optimism in life. You need to be the glass half full. Again, that's surrounding yourself with positive people and, you know, not being, you know, a complainer or looking at the problems and doing nothing about it, but identify problems, come up with the solutions and just get on and, and, and apply it. So mm -hmm. um, those are just a couple of books that have kind of impacted on me in a positive way. Wow. A lovely full circle of different angles as well for life. <laughs> I love that. Um, so fast forwarding for you in the future what does the future hold for you or what are some things that you're working on that you might like to let our listeners know about um i think what you've probably seen is that there's um lots of dots that are out there and many of the dots i'm involved with so i think um again that networking idea of actually joining those dots through people and the different industries um whether it's the the clinical the technical or, or the or the business side of things so you know um i'm kind of really exploring further the cloud and pushing that and the benefits of you know anytime anywhere any device um uh, ai clearly radiology has got a huge kind of first mover advantage in that and it's to um learn about it uh, adopt it evaluate it and mm -hmm. see how good it is uh, and to make changes with, with one's colleagues across the ecosystem the other important thing in ai is actually developing a platform because there's hundreds of solutions we just need kind of a, a simple platform to integrate and know that a bit like an app store and um, that you know the, the, the certain quality uh, affiliated with them um, and also um, augmented reality is another area of interest that I've developed with um, collaboration with Microsoft and their HoloLens device. And that's just a um, mixed reality, virtual reality device that allows us to, um, in the clinical world, train medical students or staff um, in a much more interactive, intuitive way. For example, you can treat train medical students anatomy 50% faster, 40% better retention. You can 
educate patients prior to complex surgery, such as brain surgery. They have better informed consent. They're more relaxed, better understanding. Um, collaboration with our colleagues virtually, um, whether it's on site or uh, across the globe. Um, Intraoperative assistance, preoperative planning, uh, virtual ward rounds, and you know even in a remote assistance, so that you bring expertise to, you know, um, uh, ten miles across the city, across the other side of the country, to the other side of the world. Whether you're an expert nurse, um, GP, doctor, um, or any one of those um, paramedical people, um, is just bringing it anywhere, anytime. And again, much better, faster, and cheaper. Digital twins are another thing in, that's mm. going to be really important because there's so much um, out there in terms of medical data, genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, um, digital healthcare records, um, imaging, pathology, bloods, um, and the healthcare records, so that they're all um, in combined, but they're all siloed. They need to be brought together through AI, AI but particularly, I think, you know, generative AI and quantum computing will allow us actually to give much more personalized um, precision medicine um, and these digital twins that will allow us to actually have a much better understanding of each of us, what we're likely to need and whether it's to predict, prevent um, or to, to treat. And again, to have not um, just longer lifespans, but better um, health spans. Um, and that we're happier and that there's less disparity. So those are kind of a, a couple of things that, um, you know, I think are, are part of the future that I hope to um, explore further with others. Again, it's fundamentally about people, but it's a really exciting world we're living in today. Um, there's lots of challenges, but I think there's lots of solutions. And I think we just have to be optimistic, um, like Michael Dowling. That's brilliant. And I think with that, it's a brilliant way to end and to say goodbye and to just thank you so much again for your time. Thank you for giving us such a brilliant overview of you know where things are currently at for you, for the people around you. And thank you so much for that lovely advice, too. I think there's some really compelling things that are going to stick with a lot of us. I know definitely for me um, from this talk. So really appreciate your time, John. Very well, my absolute pleasure and uh, have, a, have a nice day.